Okay, it's been a little while since I did one of these note videos, and what started out as an analog note-taking movement for me internally has become something a little bit more. I just got this today. It's a paper calendar. It's a pretty basic paper calendar. As you can see, that's it. There are no other pages other than this. It's very simple, two colors. What I've been realizing as I've been slowly making my uh, movement towards a fully analog note-taking system or movement back to a fully analog note-taking system, I've been realizing similarities. So one of the things that always bothered me about digital that took me a really long time to come around on was this feeling that I was always I didn't have control and what I mean by that is I used to say I, could, I can't seem to zoom out enough that's fun what the camera did there <laughs> I can't seem to zoom out enough I can't seem to see an overview of everything in the way that I need to what I was really saying and I didn't realize is I'm out of touch with uh, the scope. See, there's something about a physical object that gives you a generalized scope. For example, when you're reading a book, you can kind of go like this and see how many pages are left. It gives you an idea. Something about the physical reality gives you an idea of the linearity of the story. You know, if there's only 20 pages left and it's feeling like this could be the end of the story, it probably is. If you're halfway through the book and it's feeling like the end of the story, you know it isn't. But to take that into the context of notes, when you have notes in a digital format, for every intent and purpose, they're invisible to you unless you you know, create structures or the app creates structures to kind of present them to you, but then you're only seeing them in the way that it's chosen to be presented. Whereas with analog, regardless of what you do, it's there in physical space. So I can let things pile up physically and eventually the physical inconvenience of something piling up on my desk is going to force me to confront it. Whereas in the digital world, I can let things pile up. And as long as I never go in that folder, I may never even remember I have things piling up there or tag or whatever you want to use for the context. My point is, is it's very easy for things to become invisible without going too far into this. And we'll get around to this thing in a second, how this relates. I'm going to use the example of Rome research. When I talk about digital apps. I'm not dissing the people making these. I think they're all brilliant. I think they're all doing something that blows me away. I'm just talking about how they're not working for me. And I know that, uh, that there are other people out there that feel the same way. And it just doesn't work for some people. It might be my generation. It might be my age. But anyways, going back to Rome research, the idea of an app like that, it's also seen in apps like LogSeq, is to make notes in your daily pages as if they are journal pages. And then these things will connect over time because of tags and because of backlinks and stuff like that. And then as they connect, you'll start to see how everything is interlaced. But here's the thing. If you throw a whole bunch of stuff in there and you don't have a tag structure, and you don't have backlinks, you just, you need to put a lot of stuff in there. And then you move on to the next day and you move on to the next day. And you never create those. If you don't search for the specific words in those pages, for all intent and purpose, they're invisible to you. They're gone, they've disappeared. And that is what I meant when I said, I felt like I wasn't in control, that I couldn't zoom out enough. It was that it was too easy for me to accidentally lose things. That as much as these things say that they can do the organization for you afterwards, that's not completely true. You have to put some thought into it. 
or you have to purposely go back to retrieve those things. And what I felt was happening to me all the time was I was putting stuff in and then, wait, where did I put that? Or how do I find that? Or how do I want to organize that? And then that became what my purpose was. The organizational purpose, the, the, my goal became not to lose things rather than to think. That's what made me renew my interest in analog for note taking. So how does that relate to this? That relates to this in the sense that I've been feeling the same thing with my calendar. I don't have a ton of stuff. I'm not a business person who has 10 meetings every day. But because of that, maybe partially to blame because of there's not enough stuff that I'm not living in my calendar every day, I started to feel the same thing about my digital calendar that I can't zoom out enough. So I'm going to try this. I'm just going to try putting the stuff in here and being able to flip to a page and see what's going on. And we'll see how that works out. Let's get a little bit of water in. If I don't drink the water while I'm recording, my mouth starts to crackle and pop, which is really unpleasant to listen to. So I do it for you <laughs> and for me. I want to dehydrate myself here. All right, let's move on to what most of you are here for, note-taking. Where am I with the note-taking? How is it coming? Well, I've got some things. Um, some of these came today, some came in the last week, some came a few months ago, but haven't been touched yet. They're called books. <laughs> Have you heard of them? Physical. Physical books. Remember this sound? So, several months ago I bought this, Quentin Tarantino's new book. Have not cracked it yet. Why haven't I cracked it yet? Because it was a physical book and I had set like these, I don't want to say rules, but I'd set these unspoken limitations on myself. Audiobooks are this and PDFs and ebooks are this and then Sometimes I sit down and read a physical book. I have thousands of PDFs, literally, no exaggeration. Close to, I think, three or 4,000 PDFs of books. I haven't picked up any of them. I've been picking up physical books. I'm not saying that one format is superior to the other because I don't, I don't know, I don't pay attention that much. But... I have been feeling the connection to these because of the same thing that I said about physical reality, about being able to look at the book and say, I have an idea of how long this is going to take me to read. Just looking at that and looking at this. Yeah, not a ton of pictures. Okay, it's going to take a while. But it does make things interesting because when you have a book note in here, a, a bookmark, I should say, you know about where you are in the book. You know your progress. You can glance across the room. It's, you know, just look at it and say, hey, uh, I got to get back to that book. I'm only like 10% in. Not because you memorize the number, but because you can look across the room and see where the card is. Plus, it's just the act of being able to do this. You know, I want to talk about something. I want to do a video. I want to do a head or a head down video like this. I have something that at least people can look at while I'm talking other than my gesticulating hands. So I'm looking forward to reading this one. Don't have anything to say about it. I haven't cracked it yet. Just got this one today. This is Rick Rubin's new book. This one looks very interesting. I find it kind of funny that I saw this book described as even just beautiful as a work of art. Okay, I mean, it's linen. That's cool. Is there no, no bad things to say about the book, but I mean, it's a light gray linen book with the monad on it, a circle with a dot inside of it, and a circle on the back. That's it. What's what's inside? Is it crazy formatting and a lot of images? No, it's just, you know, the thing you find in books, words in sentences, in paragraphs, on pages. So, 
<laughs> so I find it interesting that people would describe what I would consider just a normal book as a work of art. I mean, the idea of writing it as a work of art, but I mean, they mean this as like a, a physical art piece. This is like a physical art piece. You just want to have this on your shelf. I feel that way about all books. Just gave you a peek about the book underneath, didn't I? <laughs> but I think it's, I just, the reason I'm bringing that up is I started to wonder, I'm like, is it that books, physical books are so rare now that like one that's well-crafted and not mass produced just automatically gets considered an art piece because it's so rare to see a book? I don't know. Looking forward to reading this one as well. These, as you can tell, these three books, there's one under there. You saw a peek of what it is. Most of you probably already know that book. It is, uh, these are going to be the thir first three books that make it into my Zettelkast. So that's part of the reason that I'm showing these. Plus, it's just cool to show books. And to listen to the sound of fingers running across. Texture. Super cool. And as you can guess, uh, this book, this just came last week. Pretty appropriate, right? <laughs> I'm already reading it. We're going to talk about that card. I'm only, I, I've only finished the intro or preface. I don't remember. We call it the intro or the preface here. Preface. I've only finished the preface. I haven't started chapter one yet. Beautiful book. Great job printing it. For those who haven't seen it. This is a, this isn't a book that pretends to be fat. I bought one book. I'd turn around and grab it, but it'd take too long. But I bought one book that was about this thick, but the margins were like in here. <laughs> so that's a little little bit of a cheat. I don't know why they did that either, because it just makes it more expensive to print and more expensive for people to buy it. And you don't make any more money off of it by doing that. But this does that doesn't happen here. This is normal. And it's great. It's full. I mean, this is how many pages? 530? No, he's... 580 something yeah 580 590 pages if you don't count these last two about the author pages a lot of you probably have read this book or want to read this book or want to buy this book buy it directly from him and don't buy it from amazon because i don't know why amazon certain books i don't know are they going through three people but like this the price seems to triple i think this was like 40 dollars on amazon which, to be honest, for a book that thick, is not that unreasonable. I mean, I'd pay $30 for this book brand new in a bookstore. I was just talking about this with the other day. Let's go on a tangent for a second before we get into this more. It just seems like a good time to talk about this and talking about physical books. We have been... Our memories of reality have been replaced because of Amazon. Ooh, that sounds crazy. What I mean is the reality of a book, the reality of how much a book should cost because of how much money is going to go to the author, how much is going to go to their agent, how much is going to go to the publication company, how much is going to go to the printing, how much needs to go to the bookstore, how much needs to go to the book distributor. The cost of a book is about $30, $20 to $30, depending on the thickness of the book. That's a reality. The $15 prices we get on Amazon are not reality and when people ask why bookstores physical bookstores are dying it's because people walk into a store and they go ooh thirty dollars yeah you're not just paying for the book you're paying for the place that you're standing in you're paying for the bookstore you're paying for the person who curates those shelves and brings in the right books so that when you walk in the book you want is the one sitting on the shelf so what Scott's doing here is really special because he cares a lot about this, from what I can tell, about anti-net Zettelkasten, about bringing people back to analog. So he's selling them on the website for, I believe, basically cost. I'm sure it's a little bit above cost. He doesn't want to, I mean, he deserves to make some money, right? He spent how many years making this? But the $40 price is a little high, but I would have paid 30 for a book like this easily. Okay, <laughs> I just had to get that out. It's been brewing behind the scenes. I had to get that out. 
because what I have to talk about is is I, I've only got through the preface. I don't have a ton to talk about the note taking thing. I just I want to talk about my bib note. I use my bib note as a bookmark because, duh. If I want to find where my bib note is while I'm reading the book, what better place to look than in the book? And when I read the book, I don't have to go look for the bib card here. So here's how I'm doing it so far. Now, remind, uh, let me remind you, I have not read anything but the preface here. So nothing that Scott says about cards in here, uh, or almost nothing, is likely to show up here in what I've done. This is what I've done off of watching videos of Scott's videos. There's a couple other guys. FP, I think is the guy's name. He's like a teacher guy with a beard. He does nice videos on anti-net Zettelkasten as well. And then uh, there's a guy, ironically, another guy with a beard. <laughs> Bald guy with a beard. Jeffrey something. He used to do tech videos. Now he's been, he's uh, switched over to analog note taking. And he's done a few videos on that as well. So I watched his videos. I, I want to say Jeff Walker, but I'm not positive. Anyways, between those three things I saw and just kind of like thinking about things myself, this is what I've put together so far. I'm not completely happy with it. Number one, I messed up, but I'm trying to accept that the thing about analog is it's okay for it to be messy, you know? I really want to go back and make this remake this someday I can bib notes are going to be filed by the author so author at top because when I'm shuffling through the cards I want to be able to see that the most easily I'm not sure that I need a what Scott does the bib card number he does like a bib dot author's last name I think maybe first initial and then a number of some sort I'm not sure I need that because if I want to reference a book I'll just say the book's title or probably the author's last name and then the book's title that's fine for me I know it takes up a little bit more space but I don't care it's not that big of a deal to me and it's it's, it's more in line with the way my brain thinks I don't want to I don't want to code everything, then I have to relearn everything. Now, I may change my mind on that as I get into it and find that there's something key there that he's seen that I'm not. But for now, that's how I feel. Title, I, <laughs> I had a little trouble with this. Anti is an acronym, but the net isn't really an acronym. I just put the whole thing capitalized. Whatever. Settle cast in. Okay, now here's one of the things I'm not sure about. One of the things I'm going to change. Part of me, first of all, wanted to do all caps on the title, but then I won't know, like in this case, when something is capitalized and something isn't. Not sure if that's important, but I have been thinking about it. The reason I want to, I'm feeling I want to capitalize the title is I need some differentiation here for me visually, some visual differentiation between the title and the subtitle. That's important to me because especially something like this, I'm going to pull it out. I'm not, this isn't the part I read. This is something I'm going to glance at to make sure I got the right book. So I want the information on this part of a bib card to be the most visually efficient. And this is not visually efficient enough for me. But I did put a space here to give the book of the year of publication. That's easier to read. I do like the idea of putting the goal. Why am I reading this book? And then I'm also putting up here in a box. I'm putting the year that I read the book because I do reread books a lot. And when I go into a book, I don't want to bring the notes that I took the first time or the time before with me. I'll go back to them after I finish the book that time, you know, like, okay, now that I read this in 2023, let me go look at what I said, at what I said about it in 2021. But I don't feel like I want that to bleed in because I feel like when we read books, one of the great things about reading books is that we change as people. So the person reading the book is a different person every time. So you get different things, different things stand out. Uh, it's kind of incredible. So 
I want to be able to do that as blindly as possible. Which is why, do I have an example here? I mean, you'll know what I mean, but I have been doing, typically what I used to do is when I had something that I was quoting or something that I wanted to save the quote for, I would typically put a line on the side, tell me where the quote began and where it ended. In the sake of trying to follow more of uh, Scott's suggestions, I'm trying with a dot, just the dot. And like, it gives me a general idea, like, okay, this is close. You know, it doesn't tell me where it begins or where it ends, which might be a good thing that friction and not knowing exactly, you know, before when I was younger, I used to put a box around the exact sentences. But the problem with that, when I go to read the book later, everything is boxed. So I'm already telling myself, pay attention to this, pay attention to this, pay attention to this. The dots are going to kind of do that, but only generally. When I go through and read here, if I'm in the flow, maybe I won't even notice the dots. But at the most, it's going to say something here was important to me. I guess I could always just do it in pencil and erase them afterwards, but I mean, pencil doesn't erase that good. So I'm not super worried about it. But that's kind of what I'm doing. And so far it works. Uh, I like that. Let's go back to this. Is there anything else I want to say about the front? I chose to do landscape because when I file them, they're going to be in landscape. But then everything else will be like this. Now what I started out doing here is circling the page numbers. Because once again, I want things to be visually separated. I don't, I don't like the way this looks because if I'm just glancing at this, my brain automatically thinks that, let me get that closer so you can see what I'm talking about. My brain's gonna automatically think that these page numbers are <laughs> related to the note. So, I mean, even if it takes just a split second for me to go, oh yeah, that's not, that's not what I was doing. That's just adding to the cognitive load when I don't need to. So I was going with circles, but if you notice here, the problem is, is the lines get further apart because the circle needs room. So it seemed like a waste of space. So I think what I'm going to try to do, and I'll probably try to incorporate this on the front of the book as well, is maybe try to work out the use of color. You know, for example, I'm really into this uh, mustard zebra sarasa pen. This is one of the colors that when I bought these pens, I was like, yeah, I'll probably never use that mustard one. Love this one. I don't know why. I might use that for the page numbers. It might be a cool way to differentiate that and then just do this in blue or black or gray. This gray is pretty sexy, isn't it? Either way, I'm going to try to introduce some color there, I think, just for variation. I don't want to get too crazy because I, I honestly, I don't want to have to have this with me when I read a book. So it might just go down to like two colors, maybe three, Ooh, maybe three. You saw two colors on, I put two colors on the uh, planner. I, tr I narrowed that down to two colors. But I think, yeah, maybe I'll do a, a blue or a black, oh, probably a blue and a black, and then the yellow. And then if I ever go back and I want to add things, you know, editor marks and so forth, add to things on the notes, or uh, maybe when I, when I'm doing the actual analog, I mean the actual anti-net cards, as opposed to the bib cards, when I reference another card, maybe I'll use a red. And I won't need to have the red on me when I'm reading because I'll just need the red on me when I'm working with the with the note cards so that's something I'm thinking about I think color is gonna make a big difference here um, like I think this could be gray this could be gray uh, this could be gray this could be gray maybe even the subtitle could be gray you know who knows I'm gonna play around with it I'll probably probably just kind of doodle in a notebook and see what looks visually appealing that doesn't require like six colors but I think color will be a good addition to this. 
and uh, that's where I am so far. These are my notes so far. Let's see if there's anything here that I want to talk about. Oh, actually, this is a good one. So one of the first things I did when I got the book, I just kind of flipped through here, and then I read the table of contents, as Mortimer J. Adler tells you you should do, right? And then I saw this. Appendix A and Appendix B, Luminian tree structure. This was one of the things I was very curious about because Scott uses the academic disciplines as his groupings in his slip box. I was curious what Lumen did because I know that it, that wasn't what Lumen did or not likely what Lumen did because I knew he had like almost 200 categories in the first Zettelkast that he created and then I believe 10 or 11 in the second one. So I was really curious what those were. And when I saw that, I flipped back here and discovered that that's exactly what is back here. It shows his categorization. And I believe I talked about in a previous video that I was considering using my own categories. Well, it turns out that that's basically what Lumen did. Terminology, method, state of emergency. He saw where his projects or where his groupings were and created categories based on that. And I think I might do the same. What I'm curious about, and I wonder in the history sections of this, if Scott tells this part, but I'm curious, did Lumen create these categories before he started making cards or after? That would be interesting to know. I believe these were definitely done afterwards. You like that hedging? I believe definitely. <laughs> I remember somebody saying that these were done afterwards which gives me the feeling that these were done before. And I would like to see one of the things I'm curious about as I get into the book, how his numbering of categories works into his numbering of cards, because I believe his is a little bit different than the way Scott's is. Because I have a seen, I have, a, I have seen a couple of Lumen's cards and his cards aren't all in the thousands the way that Scott's are. So I'm curious to see the difference and which of the two of them, uh, which of their two methods I prefer. Or maybe neither. Who knows? I know some other people do like a, almost like a Dewey Decimal System type thing. That's cool. I, I've always thought the Dewey Decimal System was an underrated and extraordinary invention. Uh, let's drink a little bit of water. A little bit of water. and make sure there's nothing else here that I want to talk about before we get out of here. Nope, that's it. Oh, side note. I thought it was pretty cool. If you've read the book, did you think it was cool? The section on uh, the preface, page XV, where he talks about the people who use systems that weren't necessarily Zettelkasten yet, but kind of were moving towards something similar to that like Hegel and uh, Jules Verne and a bunch of other people. I thought that was fascinating and I'd like to learn more about it. I hope in some way he mentions uh, some of that in the history sections here because I'm curious about how they worked. Because sometimes, you know, maybe something somebody before Lumen had a good idea that got lost. Um, there's nothing that says that Lumen had the perfect system, but he had the nearest from what I've from what I've seen from people who actually create one and start working with it. Okay, so that's where I am right now. Hopefully you guys leave some comments. Let me know what your thoughts are. And uh, I'm curious in particular, one question I want to ask you guys, have you used color in your Zettelkasten? And if you have, uh, in what ways? Okay, oh, and also, have you used... Uh, visual arrangement for your cards is that something that plays in for you guys or is it just because i'm on the spectrum and stuff like that just like i have to figure that stuff out <laughs> because it drives me crazy okay that's all thanks you thanks you guys and uh see you soon